Greetings. Well, today we're going to continue with our constant discussion of uh, Russia and gangs on with Vladimir Putin. Uh, I would advise you to visit one of my sites, geopoliticaltimes.com, geopoliticaltimes.com, to read the best available news that are here in this world. So, <coughs> today's theme will be the abductions of a United States officer uh, by Russia and his imprisonment in the Gulag archipelago. The other th uh, theme today will be uh, the Carnegie, I never knew how to pronounce it, Carnegie, 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 uh, Carnegie, uh, Carnegie Foundation is exposed as, as a uh, KGB operation in the United States. So. First of all, we have to uh, say that Russia has captured uh, Eston Kochva, a United States officer, just after Obama was leaving Estonia to show the Estonians that supposedly uh, Russia is still in charge in the dear nation of Estonia. Uh, this is, these news are from August the 19th. A Russian court on Wednesday sentenced an Estonian security service officer to 15 years in prison for spying in a case that Estonian officials dismissed as revenge for the man's investigation into a Russian smuggling ring. Uh, 
Estonia says that the officer Eston Kokova was abducted by unknown gunmen and taken across the Russian border. Russia claims that Kokova was detained on its territory after illegally crossing from Estonia. The regional court in the western city of Pskov on Wednesday found Kokova guilty of spying, armed smuggling and violating border regulations and ruled to send him to a high security prison for 15 years. Russian news agencies quoted Judge Ju Yulia Ulyanova as saying that the court would hand over cash, a gun and a recording device found on Kochva to the Russian Federal Security Service. Estonian authorities said Kochva was investigating a smuggling operation involving agents from the Russian intelligence agency. Estonian Prime Minister Tavi Rovas condemned the verdict, saying in a Twitter post on Wednesday that Kochva's illegal detention constitutes a grave violation of international law by Russia. Relations between Russia and Estonia, a former Soviet Republic which shares a border with Russia, have often been uneasy, but Moscow's support of pro-Russian separatist rebels fighting in Ukraine has heightened the, their tensions. The European Union's Foreign Affairs Chief, Federica Mogherini, said Kochva's abduction and detention violated international law. Moreover, from the very beginning, Mr. Kochva has been deprived of the right to a fair trial. There was no public hearing of the case. The Estonian consul was not allowed to pr be present at the hearings, and Mr. Kochva was deprived of adequate legal aid. She called for Kochva to be released immediately and allowed to return to Estonia. Also, Russia has hit French chain Auchan with food inspections. Russian authorities are conducting systematic inspections at French supermarket chain Auchan following concerns about poor quality meat, a top consumer rights official said Wednesday. The inspections came at a time of tension between France and Russia over the extension of the European Union sanctions and France's decision to cancel a deal to provide warships to Russia. Instruction inspections are underway across all of Oshan's stores in Moscow with the support of prosecutors, said Anna Popova, head of the state consumer protection agency Rospotrebnadzor, in comments reported by Russian media. Since the middle of June, a systematic complete plan inspection of all shops from the Oshan chain in Moscow is underway, Popova said. Uh, the company's website says it has 19 outlets in Moscow with several more in surrounding areas. No reasons for the inspections were reported on Wednesday, but the move follows allegations by another Russian government agency, Rosel Khoznadzor that Oshan's pork products had been found to contain DNA from cows, chickens and horses. <laughs> the company has also accused, was also accused of prolonging expiry dates on meat products. Oshan's office in Moscow declined to comment on the latest inspections. Last week, the French embassy denied it had expressed concern over Ross Rossel Hodnazor allegations, uh, but said it had contacted the agency for clarification on technical issues within the bounds of working contacts. Last year, during tensions with the US over the Ukraine crisis, McDonald's restaurants in Russia were subject to a range of inspections, with food safety concerns cited and the company's flagship restaurant in Moscow was temporarily closed. Rospotrebnadzor has often accused, has often been accused, of using its powers to block imports of food products 
for political purposes, with items from countries such as Georgia and Ukraine previously blocked at times of political tension. Now we are going to deal with the Carnegie Foundation and its open alliance with uh, with Vladimir Putin. Of course, I have to mention that Kissinger is in the pay of the KGB. Uh, also, uh, Bajinsky has has uh, been rather soft in Russia. But let's see, how a U.S. think tank fell for Putin. The Carnegie Moscow Center used to be a hub of Russian liberalism. Now it stands accused of being a Trojan horse for Russian influence. Last June, three months after Russia annexed the Crimean Peninsula, and just weeks before Russian-backed separatists in eastern Ukraine shot down a civilian airliner, killing nearly 300 people, a small group of Americans and Russians gathered on the Finnish island of Boista. Policy analysts and former government officials, they had come to dis discuss the fate of the post-Soviet country whose democratic revolution had had helped sink U.S.-Russian relations to their lowest point in three decades. The symbolism of the location could not have been lost on the meeting's participants. Sharing an 800-mile border with Russia, Finland has delicately managed relations with its neighbor. During the Cold War, it adopted a policy of formal neutrality accepted Soviet interference in its domestic politics and imposed vigorous, rigorous self-censorship to avoid provoking Moscow. This phenomenon of voluntarily choosing limited sovereignty to appease a large and aggressive neighbor earned the moniker Finlandization, and the Soviet Union held up Finland as an example of its ability to live in peace and friendship with its neighbors. At the time of the Boisto meeting last summer, foreign policy luminaries like Henry Kissinger, Zbigniew Brzezinski, and David Ignatius were trumpeting, quote, Finlandization as a model for Ukraine to follow. But what was most notable about the Boisto meeting, which eventually produced a 24-point plan to resolve the crisis was what it lacked, Ukrainians. Large powers discussing the fates of smaller ones while simultaneously locking them out of the room has an understandably ugly resonance in Central and Eastern Europe. By excluding Ukrainians, the Boisto Initiative signatories lent credence, wittingly or not, to the Russian view that Ukraine is not a real country and that outside forces can determine its fate. As for the Boisto proposals themselves, most were amenable to the Kremlin line. For instance, in calling for both sides to withdraw forces from certain conflict areas in eastern Ukraine, the signatories treated aggressor and victim as moral equals, likening Russian removal of its soldiers with Ukraine's withdrawing troops from its own sovereign land. Full disclosure, I signed an open letter at the time rejecting the Boisto initiative alongside dozens of other foreign policy analysts, including most important Ukrainians. Uh, this article was written by James Kerchik, and I applaud him on this. 
Boister was an example of what's known in diplomatic parlance as a track to negotiation. When parties close to, but not officially representing, national governments engage in discussions about topics of mutual concern. While America and its European partners ignored Boister, the Russian Foreign Ministry seized on it, quote, on our behalf, we welcome intentions of the public and the academic societies to contribute into the resolution of the situation in the southeast of Ukraine and to put an end as soon as possible to bloodshed encouraged by Kiev authorities. Forceful measures. Red A Ministry Statement. Happy to promote anything that flatters its self-image as a great power and goes over the heads of Ukrainians. Moscow evidently saw promotion of the Boista proposal as in its interests. The Boista Group's meeting was sponsored by three entities. The Finnish Foreign Ministry, which is an arm of the KGB, the Institute for World Economy and International Relations, a think tank affiliated with the Russian Academy of Sciences, which means KGB, and the Carnegie Corporation of New York, one of the largest funders of the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, which describes itself as, quote, the oldest international affairs think tank in the United States. End quote. Such a long-running pedigree hasn't been without its hiccups. A former president of Carnegie was Olga Hiss, the State Department official who spied for the Soviets. Boisto's first three signatories were Tom Graham, a former associate of the Carnegie Endowment and a managing director at Kissinger Associates, Andrew Weiss, the Carnegie Endowment's vice president for studies, who also serves as a senior advisor at the Albright Stonebridge Group, and Diana Arsenian, Vice President of the International Programme and Director of the Russian Programme at the Carnegie Corporation. On the Russian side, the delegation included, among others, Alexei Yerbatov, a scholar in residence at the Carnegie Moscow Center, and Vyacheslav Trubnikov, a former head of the country's Foreign Intelligence Service, SVR, which is a direct heir to KGB. So the officials of the SVR uh, and the members of the Carnegie Foundation have met in Finland to discuss the Finlandization of Ukraine without any influence or any say in the matter of the Ukraine. And the Russian Foreign Ministry has applauded the results and the declaration that follow this meeting. Policy analysts who simultaneously work for major consulting shops founded by former Secretaries of State Henry Kissinger and Madeleine Albright respectively, Graham and Weiss, who also served as co-chairs of the Boisto Initiative, are influential players in the transatlantic conversation about Russia, although it's unclear where their analytical work stops and their business interests begin. Graham's bio at Yale's, Yale's Jackson Institute for Global Affairs, where he is a senior fellow, states that he focuses on Russian and Eurasian affairs for Kissinger Associates. Graham did not reply to an email asking him to discuss the nature of his work. Weiss Bio at Albright Stonebridge states that he assists clients with issues related to Russia and the countries of the former Soviet Union. In an email he told the Daily Beast, my role at Albright Stonebridge Group is focused on helping Western companies and philanthropic foundations understand Russian political and economic realities. 
and that the Carnegie Endowment had strict conflict of interest policies about outside consulting, which I fully abide by. Weiss did not elaborate on whether such policies prevent him from advising businesses trying to navigate around sanctions imposed on Russia for its behavior in Ukraine, telling me that he can't discuss client-specific work at Albright Stone Beach Group. I don't want to be holier than thou, a Russia analyst at a prominent Washington think tank said when asked about Graham and Weiss' work as business consultants while also dispensing ostensibly objective analysis. It seems to be a direct conflict of interest. I actually think American business money is potentially more difficult to manage than Russian money. In all honesty, because I think the American corporate interests are engaging because they have an agenda with Russia and they are much more savvy about how to exercise their influence. Arsenian, in her capacity as head of the Carnegie Corporation's Russia program, has undertaken a project called Rebuilding U.S.-Russia Relations, a website featuring brief articles by scholars, the vast majority of which argue for a diplomatic detente with the Kremlin, oppose arming Ukraine, or discourage Western sanctions against Russia. Under their tutelage, Carnegie has attempted to steer the debate over the Western response to Russia in a direction more aligned with Kremlin interests. Carnegie's role as a convener and promoter of the Boisto plan is but one element of a dramatic shift in its agenda from an institution that once hosted some of the Kremlin's sharpest critics to a place now urging Western appeasement of an ever more aggressive Russia. Carnegie was the first major Western think tank to open a branch in Russia following the breakup of the Soviet Union, and ironically, it may be the last. 1994, when the Moscow Center was founded, was a period of optimism for liberal reform of the post-communist system and Carnegie Moscow was one of the leading Western outposts, providing independent and reliable analysis of Russian domestic policies and foreign policy. After Vladimir Putin came to power in 2000, and throughout his rise as Russia's new czar, the center built a reputation for quality and insight. That reputation was built in part upon the work of three individuals, Lilia Shevtseva, a political scientist and one of the wo most well-respected analysts of Russian politics, Nikolai Petrov, who headed the center's Society and Regions program, and Maria Lipman, a journalist and author who edited the center's renowned Russian language pro and contra journal. All three have been vocal and prominent critics of Putin and the corrupt and sclerotic system he has imposed. The center began to undergo serious change, however, after Putin returned to the presidency in 2012, following a rigged election and violent crackdown on pro-democracy protesters. In January 2013, Petrov left after his program was cancelled not due to lack of funds, he contends, but a desire not to ruffle Kremlin feathers. My own explanation was that the move was initiated by Dmitry Trenin, the Moscow Center's director, whose point was there are some important functions Carnegie should serve, like communication on high-level nuclear issues and so on, and domestic politics is a troublemaker and it would get be good to cut off this part of Carnegie, Petrov told the Daily Beast. Given the increasingly adverse environment in Russia for Western institutions, pressure from the Russian government on Carnegie need not have been explicit.
the move, Petrov said, may have been a reaction to some direct signals, or this could be preemptive action in order to avoid some troubles. Trenin did not reply to an email seeking comment for this story. Next to go was Lipman, laid off in the summer of 2014 due to what she was formally informed were person personnel cuts. This came as a surprise, not least because in 2013 Carnegie Moscow had received a three-year grant of $350,000 from the MacArthur Foundation to fund the publication of Pro and Contra. Lippmann told me she was never able to get an answer for why she lost her job and her journal when Pro and Contra still had two more years of funding. Weiss says Carnegie decided to replace Pro and Contra with a Russian language website, Carnegie.ru. Carnegie people flatly denied any political reasons behind it, and I have no reasons not to trust them, Lipman said. Last out the door in October was Shevtsova, who only two months earlier had signed the open letter protesting the Boisto Manifesto, pitting her against her superiors, Arsenian and Weiss. Shevtsova, who is now affiliated with the Brookings Institution, told the Daily Beast. Carnegie has been a wonderful place over the years with a strong tradition of pluralism of views, including most prominently liberal principle views. Over the past year or two, however, I have sensed that this has changed with a squeezing out of different points of view. Three months after Shevtsova's departure in January 2015, Carnegie announced the hiring of three new analysts in its Moscow office, ostensibly to replace the veterans who had left. I am a great admirer of Shevtsova, Marsha Lipman and Nikolai Petrov, and there are remarkable contributions to Carnegie Moscow Center over many years, Weiss said in an email. However, one current Carnegie staffer has referred to Lipman and Shevtseva as dinosaurs in this author's presence. <laughs> as the Russian government ratchets up a xenophobic campaign targeting Western non-governmental organizations, accusing them of espionage and attempting to foment a coup, Carnegie's presence in Moscow continues to be tolerated. Its name is conspicuously missing from the latest list of undesirable organizations compiled by the Russian government, which includes many other institutions of similar profile, George Soros Open Society Foundation, the National Endowment for Democracy, Freedom House, the Charles Stuart Mott Foundation, and the MacArthur Foundation, the latter of which announced last week that it will leave Russia due to Kremlin pressure. Adding to the mystery of Carnegie's absence from the list of undesirable organizations is that MacArthur, Mott and Open Society have all funded the Moscow Center. My impression is that there have been basically two reactions to the Kremlin crackdown on foreign NGOs, says the Russia analyst at the prominent DC think tank. One is basically what we saw with the MacArthur Foundation, being asked to do things we don't think we can do, so goodbye and good luck. The other is to conclude that there has, has to be good relations, so let's accommodate demands that are being made. I know how difficult it is to manage these programs. There are a lot of people I know who have been associated with Carnegie who aren't anymore, and it looks a little bit to me that they've kind of caved in, the analyst said. The Russian government's recent attacks on foreign NGOs and foundations are nothing less than a witch hunt, wise email. Yet it's a witch hunt that has noticeably not ensnared Carnegie. A list of events held by the Carnegie Moscow Center on its website 
provides one clue to why this must might be the case. Scarcely any have addressed internal Russian politics, or more amazingly, the ongoing war in Ukraine. Carnegie Moscow used to be a venue where events were held regularly, and I would say quite frequently, that discussed current developments in looking at various aspects of Russia. I don't see any such events anymore, and if they still hold them, they are much fewer. According to Gary Kasparov, the Russian chess grandmaster, human rights activist and Daily Beast contributor, Carnegie functions in a role not unfamiliar to students of the Cold War as a tribune of the West through which Russian intelligence whispers the official Moscow line, or rather what Moscow wants the West to believe is that line. The Moscow Center is the sort of operation that influential actors in the Kremlin, he said, use at a time when they need to communicate their message to the West, not from official structures, but from something that is viewed as independent and even American. Indeed, the motivation to cozy up to the Kremlin may have little to do with venality. I think, actually, the funding is less of an issue said the think that tank analysts when asked if the Russian government, state and companies or other entities might be attempting to influence American public opinion via covert funding of Washington policy institutes. I think Russian money is potentially problematic. My impression is everybody is super sensitive about it. I think the issue is access. It reminds me of a lot more of the Soviet there, uh, days, there's a subtle self-censorship that begins to creep in. Over half a dozen Russia analysts at prominent Washington-based think tanks consulted for this article chose not to go on the record with their concerns about out of professional courtesy, but they joined Kasparov in assessing that Carnegie has decided to place a premium on maintaining the pr its presence in Moscow, sacrificing its intellectual independence and analytical rigor in the process. Certainly this was done with a measure of concern about the direction that the Russian government was taking with NGOs and probably an effort to stay under the radar, a former Carnegie Moscow Center employee told the Daily Beast about the makeover of its staff characterizing much of what the center publishes today as the product of self-censorship. A former U.S. governmental official who has worked in Russia characterized Carnegie to me as a Trojan horse of pro-Kremlin sentiment in Washington. One person who has played a key role in managing this balancing act is Trenin, the center's director who has been affiliated with the Moscow office since its inception. Prior to his career as a think tank analyst, Trenin spent 21 years in the Soviet army, achieving the rank of colonel. An, an, an analysis of his work since the Ukraine crisis began reveals a telling pattern of making oddly sanguine predictions of Russian behavior followed by appeals to the US and Europe that they are sent to Russian belligerents. Despite what some Ukrainians suspect, Moscow is unlikely to try bringing about the breakup of Ukraine in order to annex its southern and eastern parts. That would mean civil war next door, and Russia abhors the idea, Trenin wrote last February, just weeks before Russian troops invaded and annexed Crimea. Having inaccurately predicted Russian restraint, Trenin then telegraphed what would soon emerge as a major Russian propaganda point, endorsing the federalization of Ukraine, a devotion of power going far beyond the decentralization favored by the West, 
that would allow the Kremlin to project hegemony over the country's eastern provinces politically rather than militarily, the more costly alternative. Although federalization is seen in Kiev and western Ukraine as a step toward ultimate partition, Trenin wrote, it could in fact help hold Ukraine together. Trenin's kid gloves treatment of Putin's expansionist girls has remained consistent throughout the conflict. The idea of Russia sending forces into Ukraine has always looked fairly incredible to me at this point, ever since the beginning of the, this present crisis, he said last May, two months after Russian forces occupied Crimea and the peninsula's annexation was formalized with a vote by Russia's Federation Council, its rubber stamp upper chamber. Believing that Russia is preparing to intervene militarily would be a severe underestimation of Putin's intellectual capabilities, he told the Financial Times the following month. Asked about Moscow's support for pro-Russian separatists in Ukraine's east, Trenin downplayed its decisive role in all arming, supplying and coordinating their assaults on Ukrainian targets. They perform a function for Moscow, but no more than that, he said. Though he usually delivers his analysis in a dry, dispassionate tone, my God, how much more of this. Jesus Christ. Though he usually delivers his analysis in a dry, dispassionate tone, Trenin, in a recent interview, gave a boldly emotional response. Earlier this month, he told the semi-independent radio station Echo of Moscow, the Soviet Union lost the Cold War, I say it as a citizen of Russia. But when an American says that the USSR lost the Cold War, my reaction is different. If he says so, he demonstrates to me his superiority, or his lack of knowledge, or his cockiness. That a Westerner cannot so much as point out historical fact without evoking feelings of grievance and wounded national pride in a former Soviet military officer who has worked for an American organization for the past two decades, seems to complicate the latter's role as an objective observer of Western-Russian relations. Indeed, according to Petrov, the former Carnegie analyst, I would say that if in the past Trenin was occupying a very balanced position, very good at describing the situation from two points of view, the Russian perspective and the West perspective. Now his Western part is cut off, and he describes everything from the Kremlin's perspective most of all. If Carnegie's softer line on the Kremlin were limited to the work of its Moscow office, such posturing could at last be explained away as a result of Kremlin pressure. But the new line is mirrored by institutional sentiments in the United States. This year, the Carnegie Corporation initiated a forum called Rebuilding U.S.-Russia Relations, overseen by Diana Arsenia. The vast majority of the pieces commissioned by the forum promotes the view that Russia, despite its riptide of anti-American disinformation, and conspiracy theories that place the State Department and CIA at the center of every major geopolitical development is a sometimes difficult friend to the United States. In April 2014, posting on the corporation's website in preface to an article in the Financial Times by Thomas Graham under the headline Pushing, Punishing an Aggressive Russia is a Fool's Errand, Arsenian wrote, The actions and the rhetoric of all involved 
are progressing along a dangerous path with potential negative ramifications for global peace and security. Such a pox on both your houses, moral equivalency, it is true, is a common refrain heard among many policy intellectuals in the West who view the European Union, NATO or US policymakers as equally responsible as the Kremlin for the mess in Ukraine. But Arsenian went a step farther in justifying a policy of non-punishment for Moscow, arguing that factual information is hard to obtain about events in Ukraine. Is it really there? A welter of independent reporting and research conducted by non-governmental organizations has solidly concluded quite a lot about the sequence of events concerning the Russian invasion and annexation of Crimea, an Anschluss that Putin himself acknowledged after having lied about it. And despite all these easy, easily verifiable acts of aggression, leading Carnegie figures persist in advising against any critical Western response. Though Weiss told me with that his side gig consulting with Albright Stonebridge is focused on helping Western companies and philanthropic foundations understand Russian political and economic realities, he insisted, I have never advocated, nor do I support, the lifting or weakening of sanctions imposed on Russia as a result of its aggression against Ukraine. His public statements, however, paint a more complicated picture. Weiss may not have as explicitly opposed sanctions per se, but he has consistently poo-pooed them as counter to the real solution of cutting a deal with the Kremlin. Quote, sanctions will make it look like we're responding and will give the administration something to point to. But I'm not sure if we are firing off sanctions, bullets that will, will be as effective on the diplomatic side, he said last year, shortly after Russia's land grab in Crimea. This March, strangely using Soviet-era solacism to refer to Ukraine with a definite article, he denigrated the use of sanctions in an interview with Reuters, stating that these tools may hurt and bite over time, but the inherent fragility of the Ukraine is so high, it is working against the ability of the West to achieve its goals. Last year, Weiss sniped at the possible use of sanctions against the tottering regime of former Ukrainian President Viktor Yanukovych, a Putin ally, amid the violence he unleashed against demonstrators on the Maidan. Sanctions are a good feel are a feel good instrument, he told NPR. They will show the outside world that the US and the Europeans are doing something, but they are really not likely to affect events on the ground. So while never coming out explicitly against sanctions, neither has Weiss endorsed them, opting instead for a subtle middle ground position that simply dismisses them as a waste of time. This is not really off-message from what Russian officialdom itself maintains. Sanctions, runs the government line, are a big yawn to the country, and we really only hurt Europe in the long term. Never mind that, as former Russian finance minister and Putin advisor Alexei Kudrin recently noted, in recorded history since 1992, this year Russia has the lowest share in the world economy. Andrei Kolesnikov, one of the three recently hired Carnegie Moscow analysts, provided a more robust opposition to sanctions when he recently wrote that what Western policymakers fail to understand is that sanctions are less likely to undermine the regime than to cause Russians to close ranks behind it. 
<laughs> oh dear. Meanwhile, Eugene Rumer, director of Carnegie, Carnegie's Russia and Eurasia program, warned, arm Ukraine and you risk another Black Hawk down. And allusion to the 1993 attack on U.S. Marines in Mogadishu that killed 18 servicemen. Reasonable people can surely argue against sending arms to Ukraine without resorting to casuistry. As rumor no doubt knows, there is no proposal currently on offer to send American soldiers into harm's way against Moscow-backed separatists or undeclared Russian troops. These are not separatists, these are the invasion forces of the Putin's Reich. As it stands, the rebels have already downed quite a few Ukrainian helicopters with a virtually unending supply of material sent to them from Russia as the Black Hawk down was struck down by the KGB. Still another talking point employed by Carnegie's leadership is the suggestion that Putin is the best of all possible leaders for Russia an assertion founded on dubious grounds that conveniently provides cover for him to carry on doing whatever he likes with impunity. In a piece headline, What's Worse Than Vladimir Putin, rumor warned against attempts to weaken Russia's current regime, as what could follow would be worse. Putin is no peach, he observed, with mocking understatement. But if current hostilities endure, and sanctions grow more painful as they will. It's possible that the next Russian leader could be more anti-Western and recalcitrant than he is. At what point Putin hostility might reach a threshold, level meriting more painful sanctions, rumor did not specify. It is certainly possible that this cohort of analysts believes a softly, softly approach towards a revanchist and deeply anti-American regime is in the best interests of Washington, and that a mutually beneficial diplomatic solution to the Ukraine crisis is the best way forward. But that makes it all the more bewildering that Carnegie has opted to liaise with Russian hardliners, pushing for a greater military intervention in Ukraine, and the advancement of Novorossiya, the term used to describe the establishment of a blood and soil ethnic Russian empire across swathes of the former Soviet Union. Why sanctions do not work? They work. Last December, Graham, Rumer and Weiss attended a conference in Moscow hosted by the Russian Institute for Strategic Studies, RISI, a think tank that, until 2009, was connected to Russia's Foreign e Intelligence Service, SVR, and now provides analysis directly to the presidential administration. Under the leadership of Leonid Reshetnikov, a retired F SVR general, the Institute strongly supported the annexation of Crimea, and according to former Institute researcher Alexander Sitin, has hosted the separatist leader Igor Gherkin, aka Igor Strelkov, this is a KGB officer who murdered during the Serbian aggression against Bosnia Herzegovina and Croatia and Kosovo, himself a former operative in Russian intelligence and a purported friend of the Institute's director. Dozens of memos were prepared, oh this is too much words, this article is awful. Dozens of memos, I, I, will, I will give my analysis of the situation at the end. Dozens of memos were prepared by the Institute on the need to form inside Ukraine clandestine Russian terrorist groups, on the need to make an offensive to take over Mariupol, Nikolaev and Odessa, and build a new Russia that would include the Transnistria that should be united with Russia as Crimea, sitting told Radio Liberty in January. In a February interview with Moskovsky Kosmomolets, Rashetnikov said the US imitators 
initi initiators of the Boista proposal, whom he characterized as responsible Americans, had visited him in Moscow prior to the summit in Finland to scope out his views. I know who was on the American side, because this same group had first visited us at the institution with the same ideas, he told the newspaper. We spent long hours with them. That an institute seeking to foment more war through clandestine terrorist groups in Ukraine would find much to be admired in US-funded think tankers is disconcerting, to say the least. Russia has returned to the 16th century. While these people continue to chant, we should not stop Russia or it could become even more dangerous. Georgi Satarov, a former advisor to Boris Yeltsin and now the head of the Indem Foundation in Moscow, told the Daily Beast. But what could be more dangerous than it is now? Ironically, the chorus is singing the same song on both sides of the ocean, in Russia and America. One watching the chorus starts thinking about the conductor and the leading voices. And here they are, in the Moscow center of Carnegie. Carnegie's dilemma is understandable. Operating a Western-funded organization in authoritarian Russia is incredibly daunting, which is why many others have either been driven out of the country or left preemptively. And as Moscow grows ever mo cl more closed off and inscrutable to Westerners, the ability of a well-connected few to present themselves as, as interpreters of what Moscow wants or what Vla Vladimir Putin is really thinking is no doubt enticing. Like all think tanks looking to influence US foreign policy, the Carnegie Moscow Center seeks access and a unique perspective. But in gaining them, has it lost its way? This is a rather good article <coughs> that continues on our perennial theme, the uh, Hitlerian regime of Vladimir Putin. And uh, the fellow who wrote it uh, My God, this Daily Beast. James Kritchik is a good analyst. I want to hear what he had to say. He says, hey gays, leave Aaron Shock alone. Aaron Shock is gay big deal. Putin bootlickers assemble in DC. I could write, I could read this if it's uh, concerning that old KGB officer Stephen Cohen. Ironically, his surname indicates that he is Jewish. There's another Cohen, Aaron Cohen in Washington, who has all the correct views. So you see how Jews can be, can be so different and Cohen, Stephen Cohen, Aaron Cohen is born in Ukraine, I know that. But Stephen Cohen, as all uh, American Jews, is probably from Ukraine. So to support a regime that uh, did uh, pogroms against Jews is really ridiculous for this. Uh, I, I bet you that the article on Putin bootlickers in DC concerns Stephen Cohen. Let's see. I could read this because it's interesting. <coughs> oh dear. She's a slavish defender of the Russian regime, Dana Rochbach. Eduard Lozansky, president of the American University in, Vos in Moscow, who is a KGB agent, invokes the horror's name. <coughs> Elga, Cohen, Stephen Cohen. <laughs> Next up was the redoubtable Stephen Cohen, America's most notorious Kremlin apologist. Faithfully labeling the conflict in Ukraine as a civil war. This is what you will see, I am from Croatia. so. The 
aggression of Serbia against Croatia during the early 90s was labeled as civil war. It was it was not a civil war, so I am really stunned when such things are spoken. Now I will give you my analysis of the situation. Uh, powerful elements in the United States the people who really uh, rule the country have Henry Kissinger and Zbigniew Brzezinski and Madeleine Albright are all high officials, former high officials of the US government. They are used as official conduits for communication and negotiation with Russia and the channel needs to be open. Uh, as I said previously the United States has entered a war with Russia as soon as the Yanukovych was uh, ousted from Ukraine. The war started. The Second Cold War, or the Third World War, or the Fourth World War, I think it's, a, it's the Fourth World War because Cold War was the Third World War. So Fourth World War has started last year with the annexation of Ukraine. The result will be a total destruction of Russia, a total destruction of the KGB clique, because Russia is a uh, totalitarian dictatorship, uh, which where the security agency is the most important arm of government, and all power and all politics comes from the ruler a former KGB officer and the current KGB officer Putin and they are so blind that they do not know that the Ukraine crisis was a test for them to cease and desist and to continue with the democratization and modernization of Russia. They refuse to do that. They would rather keep their empire intact because it's so nice working in the KGB, reading newspapers, killing people, instead of working for an international corporation. They want to keep their empire intact. Uh, the United States is another empire which is extremely aggressive, much more aggressive than Russia, much more successful than Russia, and with vastly bigger resources. So I know that Carnegie may seem to uh, favor uh, Russian views, but uh, it's, it's probably under the influence of Kissinger. Kissinger is an old pig who uh, has uh, organized his uh, uh, advisory committee, the Kissinger Group, to receive kickbacks and bribes. And of course, the KGB li likes nothing better than bribes. And believe me, Henry Kissinger is heavily bribed by the United S uh, by Russia. He is out of his mind. He is already crazy. He has he's a hundred years old. And in return for receiving bribes from Putin, he will say that Russia's uh, interests must be observed. But this is not the policy of America. If I know anything about American foreign policy, and I believe I know because I've researched it for years, America is on the war path, and Henry Kissinger is certainly <coughs> no longer a representative of the establishment. He receives bribes openly from Putin. Uh, Stephen Cohen is financed by the KGB. RT te television in Russia is financed by the KGB. And why does America allow this? Because I myself listen to RT, although I deplore everything that Putin does. Because simply it's the best way to find out what the Kremlin is thinking, what the ruler, the new Stalin, is thinking. How else could we find out when we hear uh, uh, on RT such things? Also, Carnegie. A foundation may be an operation of similar of similar value because it allows you to uh, gorge 
what the rulers of Russia think. But the mo bottom line below, below all of this, something I have already expressed, and I wish that more people could understand that a war has started between a Russia who is uh, strong only because of its nuclear power. Forget the oil, forget the gas. Uh, before this is over, all gas and oil deliveries from Russia to Europe, which is Russia's business, it is her lifeline will cease and the situation will be very very ugly I myself am not, am not uh, thinking in terms of will Putin fall, will KGB fall I'm thinking of, of, of what to do next because it's perhaps cheaper for the American Empire to keep Russia in chains such as it, it was under the, uh, the Soviet Union you have the nation uh, excluded from the world market uh, you had uh, a competitor who was predictable uh, of course after the age of Khrushchev the Russian policy was very predictable and you had uh, an opponent who you know you can win easily uh, today's Russia is the same thing an opponent who can be beaten in a few days by what America has in terms of military might not to mention uh, the economic problems that America can, can create for Russia. So it's really, it's really useless, I, I mean, to waste words, to waste breath uh, talking about this. Russia will be defeated. The only concern now is something that I would like to... Of course, it, it will be spectacular for somebody who likes uh, history or geopolitics. It is, it is enormously entertaining to see what's happening. Uh, but the real problem is what uh, happens after Putin, how will Russia be organized, how this vast territory, the greatest, uh, biggest country in the, uh, in the world, will be governed, because there are uh, vast natural resources there, vast, 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 and it all has to be organized. I, uh, ha I read a title uh, recently by... Um, by Lech Walesa, who said that Russia cannot be a democracy if it is united. So perhaps that's the way to go forward, to break up Russia into perhaps ten states or something. I don't know. That is a matter for discussion. Maybe we'll talk to you about it in the next video. Maybe we will not. In any case, thank you for if somebody has listened. I have, uh, I have uh, one follower, I believe. And I think that the information that was provided in this video was uh, rather useful, rather useful, yeah. So, until next time.